Um, thank you very much. And um, we've not been in here for a while, given that the last one was cancelled um, due to illness. So it's very good to see you all here. Um, just a couple of bits of business before we start. Um, firstly, that this is one of those weeks where we um, stay around here and um, just chat and drink after the seminar. So you're all welcome just to stay around and um, and do so. We can either talk about the what the, the talk we're about to hear. If you just want to chat about the best or worst three films ever, we can also continue that conversation <laughs> from last time. Um, the second thing is you'll notice the alert among you will notice there's a survey in front of you. I'd be very grateful if you could fill it in. It won't take you very much time. This is meant for... This is for you. Yeah, it's no big secret. Um, <laughs> all souls have bought a load of property over the covered market, which is developing. The local authority wants to know what kind of impact this is likely to have on city centre traffic. Um, uh, the most likely outcome, which is we'll be asked to pay for some more bike parking. So if you can, <laughs> um, so if you could just fill it in at some point before you leave, that would be very grateful. Right to business. Um, it's my great pleasure um, to welcome here Mark Schulenberg. Um, Mark is Professor of Digital Surveillance at the Erasmus University in um, Rotterdam. Um, he's uh, been a prominent figure over many years in various aspects of the social analysis of surveillance. He's written books on the securitization of society and hysteria. And as of last week, a book called Making Surveillance Public, um, which is here to talk about. So um, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, <laughs> and just very thank you so much for coming. <laughs> and the floor is yours, Mark. Okay. Um, thanks for the kind uh, invitation uh, to speak here. It's my first time uh, at the University of Oxford and I feel honoured. And the topic I will discuss today is the rise of uh, artificial, artificial intelligence and algorithms in the field of safety and security management. In criminology, until this day, uh, theoretical frameworks and empirical research as to how to approach AI and algorithms in relation to public safety are unclear or even completely absent. And what I would like to investigate, therefore, today is the way in which the field of the governance of security is changing due to the rise of different forms of AI applications. And I will do this by addressing two questions. The first question is to what extent does AI raise new questions with respect to the prevention and detection of crime and antisocial behavior? And the second question is how far reaching are the consequences for society in general and criminology in particular? And I will answer both questions um, in the next hour in four parts. Um, I will start with an empirical case. And the empirical case is about the Waste Navigation app, an example of what I term luxury surveillance. And luxury surveillance are products for which people are prepared to pay a lot of money because the presumed advantages in preventing crime and monitoring oneself are seen as positive characteristics. In the second part, I will discuss the central place of digital surveillance in our society and key developments in this area. In the third part, I focus on the phenomenon of big data policing, that's the use of large volumes of data unlocked by algorithms by public and private parties with the aim of making society safer and more livable. And I conclude, and that's the final and the fourth part, with different ways of studying AI and algorithms as a way of addressing the challenge of the object in the field of criminology. So the first part, an empirical case, uh, the Waze app. Uh, this happened almost two years ago um, at a moment that my girlfriend and I were getting into our Tesla. And I entered the street and house number of the Italian restaurants we we're going to that evening into the navigation app Waze. The journey is about 23 miles and according to the app, the journey should go very smoothly. The various routes are colored green which means there's no heavy traffic. And when I select the shortest, the quickest, and the most obvious route to the restaurant, a message comes up the screen suggesting I take the longest route. It's safer not to drive through a particular neighborhood, which according to the route planner is a high risk area with very high crime rates. And Waze recommends a way to avoid it. The travel time difference is 11 minutes, and I decide to take the slowest route to the restaurant instead of the fastest. 
A Waze for your information is a free navigation app for Android and iPhone developed in Israel and bought by Google in 2013. It offers what they say community-based traffic information, which entails the use of data from all Waze users to find the optimal route. It gives warnings in time for speed cameras, police, roadworks and accidents reported by other users. But Waze also warns users via the what is called avoid dangerous neighborhoods function when you're about to drive into an unsafe neighborhood and recognize routes that avoid these areas, even if driving through them would be much faster. Route planners with a similar uh, feature include Sketch Factor, Red Zone and Ghetto Tracker, whose name was later, later changed to Good Part of Town. The ads use crime figures from police forces and customer reviews of neighborhoods, supplementing them with up-to-date user reports on crime and antisocial behavior. A high-risk area is called red, and the navigation uh, system's voice announces that you're approaching an area with a high risk of crime. We all know that in the literature, the channeling of our desires towards what they call normal social behavior is called nudging. And nudges boost citizens gently in the right direction without restricting the freedom of choice. Classic examples are the fly sticker in toilets to get men to aim at the middle of the toilet bowl rather than to the edge. <laughs> Healthy products placed at the eye level in the supermarkets and use of smaller plates and glasses in canteens. But the waste app differs from traditional nudges in at least two important ways. Unlike these analog nudges, the nudging of the mind can be constantly automatically adjusted to changing circumstances. It's also possible to personalize and tailor it so that only the intended recipient is nudged. And when nudging is combined with big data and algorithms and as a specific point of intervention rather than a generic one, I speak of algorithmic psycho power. And the digital tools which this form of power is deployed are big nudges or hyper nudges. For a better understanding what I mean with algorithmic psychopower, we must turn to the work of the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler. Like Michel Foucault, Stiegler is interested in technology as an effect of the exercise of power, but he places serious question marks around Foucault's emphasis on discipline of the body and the regulation of biological life by government, better known as biopolitics and biopower. Stiegler's work is not simply to summarize and can only be represented here schematically, but in his view, a shift has taken place from biopolitics, Foucault, to what he calls psychopolitik, in English, psychopolitics. He states that in today's world, a battle for the mind is raging in the media, and he points to, and I cite Stiegler, the radio, the 1920s, television, the 1950s, and digital technologies, the 1990s, spreading all over the planet through various forms of networks, and resulting in a constant industrial canalization of our attention. Stiegler believes that new media, even more than its traditional counterpart, is constantly attempting to capture our attention and desires and to lead in the direction of more consumption. An example, of course, will be the personalized advertisements on the internet, which reduce existence to the level of direct satisfaction of needs. And referring to the work of Gilles Deleuze, he writes, a control society does not only consist in the installation throughout society of social control, but rather penetrates into consciousness and thus reinstates corporate control. In the case of algorithmic psychopower, we see something comparable to what Stiegler sketches in broad brushstrokes in the transition from biopolitics to a society of consumers. Without falling back into a Cartesian body-mind dualism, the key point of intervention for psychopower is not the body and life, as is with Foucault, but the soul or the human mind, the psyche of citizens. I take the words uh, soul and mind here as general points of reference. I will not go into the different meanings of the two terms, where the category soul is often reduced to the mind, and the same mind sometimes unjustly summarized as a purely psychological category. But what is important for me today is that the subject still undergoes discipline, However, it is now based on AI applications that affect our consciousness and our desires automatically by giving people psychological stimuli at decisive moments 
steering them unobtrusively but very powerfully in the desired direction. In the case of the Waste Navigation app, the option for an independent decision remains. In other words, I can take the shortest, the fastest route, but I'm effectively tempted to make a complete different choice. All kinds of things happen to me inside from the moment that Waze suggests a different route to the Italian restaurant. The color red on my screen sets off powerful emotions, conjuring up connotations of danger. In a philosophical sense, you might say that the seduction from the object is stronger than the desire of the subject to take the shortest route. And this example of algorithmic psychopower also shows that AI lays down an invisible barbed wire across our urban area. You could even say that geo-surveillance generates a form of data surveillance, less visible than verbal or, or physical violence, but no less violent. This follows from the fact that psychopower is part of political and economical structures and reflects a long history of exclusion mechanisms based on racist images of ethnicity and social class. The name Ghetto Tracker says it all. In her book Race After Technology, Rua Benjamin speaks of the new gym code and points out that racist processes of segregation and territorial stigmatization are creeping back in via digital surveillance methods. Yet this, what I call algo racism, is barely recognized or penalized as violence, if at all. In many cases, hypernurture will have manipulative features because the stimulus taking on the form of an instruction and such nudges target cognitive processes over which people have barely any control. This can take on very innocent forms and serve noble ends, as in the case of zebra crossings. But the use of psychopower becomes questionable when personal data is collected on a large scale without people's knowledge or consent. An example is the so-called mood detection in public space. Besides colors, the navigation app Waze, sense can also be used for behavior manipulation and restriction. For instance, in Stratum's Eind, a 300 meter long street of pubs and clubs in the Dutch city of Eindhoven that attracts around 15,000 to 20,000 young people at weekends, has experimented with emitting a calming and peaceful scent of oranges to reduce aggression and increase the sense of security. The amount, the color and intensity of light is also constantly adjusted to make an area safer, livable and more attractive. The color blue is said to have a cooling effect and a certain shade of blue can lower the heart rate, which is useful for reducing aggression. In order to be able to intervene at any moment with lights and scents, large volumes of data are collected on social interactions, police presence, waste in the street, noise levels, weather information, parking density, beer consumption, young people entering and leaving Stratum's Eind, the social media messages, among other things. AI and algorithms thus help smoothly alter the atmosphere in such spaces in ways that move and affect people, placing us in a different relationship with ourselves and others and raising the scientific question, how freely and anonymously can we still move in public space? To answer this question, I think it's necessary to consider the issue of digital surveillance in a more general sense. The question of AI in the detection and prevention of crime and antisocial behavior cannot be answered without greater focus on surveillance in society and why digital technologies have taken over control in all aspects of our lives. And this brings me to the second part of the lecture, trends in surveillance. To be sure, surveillance is not an isolated or independent development. It's embedded in a series of long running developments that are technological, economic and political in nature. And I limit, I limit myself today to six developments. Uh, digitalization and AI, that's the first one. Datification, algorithmization, multisensorial, softening and commodification is the final one. So take a look at the first three digitalization, datification, and algorithmization. Digitalization is a collective term for a large group of new technologies that have been used in every more domains over the last few decades. Rapid developments in digitalization makes it impossible to give an exhaustive list. 
but this might include applications that are now used within the broad area of AI, such as biometric recognition, predictions of risk, algorithmic decision making, recommendation systems, and so on. These applications have found their way into many sectors of society, education, financial services, transport, healthcare, and even law enforcement. They effectively form the engine of our society by maintaining its underlying organization, which makes digitalization and AI, just like our water supply, our road network, or electricity grid, so important that they exhibit all the characteristics of the new infrastructure. In relation to AI, I speak of a system technology, an invention with a systematic effect for the whole of our society, as electricity was in the 19th century and the combustion engine in the 20th. As a result of digitalization and AI, more data producing items are entering our environment. And there is more data available that says something about our lives. The plethora of applications connected to the internet and product innovations, such as consumer databases, data warehouses, and computer clouds, is making the amount of digital data ever larger. Now, the digitalization and datafication have come so central to the way in which society organizes itself. Algorithms ensure that the data collection, that's the input, leads via processing, throughput, to a conclusion, an output. But that one word, algorithm, however, covers many different types. There are logical rules, uh, means rule-based algorithms, which operate on the basis of formulas like A, then B. And in more complex forms, there are algorithms which attempt to achieve a particular aim by themselves without being given explicit instructions in the case of machine learning or deep learning algorithms, for example. I think it's important to understand that an algorithm is not an objective calculator without a character or direction. It's set up by developers, by analysts and policy makers, and this means that it's politically and culturally sensitive. Many unforeseen effects can therefore arise with the potential, depending on the context and nature of the AI application, for a substantial impact. And we've seen it with the Waste Navigation app. It raises social technological risk, such as discrimination against minorities, increased inequality, stigmatization, and over-policing as a result of technical bias and feedback loops. A fourth development is that surveillance no longer depends on the naked eye. There is in, in the classic sense, surveillance means watch and being watched. And it started with the eye, that was physical surveillance. But now technological develop, um, developments have also made hearing, smelling and taste important sources of information. Using the term of the Canadian media philosopher Marshall McLuhan, you might say that surveillance has become an extension of all human senses. For instance, there are now street lights in high burglary risk areas, which aided by complex algorithms recognize suspicious sounds, such as breaking glass, banks and shouting, in order to detect an attempted breaking. These street lights can also analyze the gate of passersby for signs that a burglar is exploring the neighborhood or that pickpockets are operating there. Mark Andreevich and Mark Burden talk of a sensor society and point to the enormous growth in sensor technology and the volume of sensory data that is generated by this. Sensors have become smaller, more mobile and cheaper and can be worn on the body, body cams, watches or glasses, or attached to objects such as vehicles, security cameras, parking meters, waste containers and entry gates to airports or in football stadiums. An important aspect related to this development is that new surveillance methods have become less visible and intrusive. And this represents what we can call a softening or a soft power in surveillance. From urine and DNA tests to scanning equipment at airports that makes it possible to search people without requiring physical contact. The soft forms of information acquisition contrast with hard traditional forms such as police interrogations, traffic stops, or house searches. The softening, and I don't know if you notice it, of surveillance technology is also reflected in our language. 
our digital modernity is characterized by light-hearted, casual and cute concepts such as cookies, Wi-Fi, airdrop, airplay and the cloud. A contributing factor in the softening of surveillance is the fact that the technology can be simply built into everyday products. There's now even a toilet on the market that recognizes users by the backsides and measures faces and urine for values such as excessive protein, unhealthy substances or other peculiarities. In this form of what you can call facial recognition, the anus is a kind of fingerprint and the people's health data are directly recorded in the electronic patient file. It brings me to the final development I'd like to discuss, the modification. These are my twins. One of the first studies on this is Oscar Gendy's great book on consumer surveillance, The Panoptic Sword, it's from 1993 already, in which he describes how personal information is gaining economical value in business. Where traditional capitalism converts material resources and labor into tradable goods and products, in surveillance capitalism, the revenue model shifts to data that has little or no independent value in the old economy including factual data and genetic information. Even search terms on Google containing spelling mistakes or the use of exclamation marks generate valuable information and are collected by tech companies. The data produced by platform users, consciously or unconsciously, actively or passively, is effectively a form of free labor or immaterial labor. It's not seen as work, but still creates value because the result can be used or sold to other parties. Data has become merchandise, and on this point, Zuboff speaks of a behavioral surplus. The use of digital traces people leave behind when they are active on the internet to improve products or services, or tune adverts and offers to individual preferences. Silent theft will be, in fact, a better term. Surveillance capitalists such as Amazon, Tesla and Google play an important role in the communication of information. This happened on digital platforms, which provide the technological, the economic and social cultural infrastructure to monopolize, extract, analyze and use the increasingly large amount of data that are recorded. In the literature on digital platforms, most attention is focused on commercial purposes, but police activity also increasingly takes place within a closed platform world. Social media platforms such as TikTok, X and Telegram in particular are a relative new source of data collection by the police. And these are used in the detection of crime or gathering online data for the sake of intelligence known as OSINT. The police also uses their own digital platforms. Besides reporting crime digitally, you can contact now webcam teams and talk to a virtual agent. An AI, an AI chatbot that speaks with people who want to report a crime. And finally, the police themselves have developed digital platforms in order to work with private tech companies on detection of crime and antisocial behavior. This brings me to the third part of the lecture, big data policing. In criminology, there is until now, to my opinion, not yet a good overview of which parties are deploying AI applications in the detection and prevention of crime and antisocial behavior. The literature on this topic is mainly restricted to phenomena like predictive policing, where the police attempts to predict whether there's a raised risk of crime in a particular time or place in order to then deploy surveillance accordingly. But the danger, I think, in criminology of such a one-sided approach is that the concept of big data policing is narrowed down to the police, one, as an institution, a second, to the preemptive logic of policing. In this way, the broader application of big data and algorithms to policing is entirely in criminology overlooked. However, various examples from the Waze Navigation app to the Apple Watch and the Fitbit, which are packed with sensors, including electric heart rate monitors, show that it's not only the police who are involved in making society secure and using AI, AI tools to do so. And this raises the question of whether criminology needs a broader view of the race of parties active in this area 
and of the applications being used. So in this third part of my talk, I will focus on the phenomenon of big data policing, which I define as the use of large volumes of data made accessible by algorithms with the aim of making society safer and more livable. Now, I distinguish here between parties involved in big data policing above, beyond, and below the police. It should be noted that in practice, this distinction will often overlap. And I will limit myself to, the, to two categories, big data policing by and beyond police. In recent years, um, so now we're making control. Stop moving. Yes. Try touching the screen. Yeah. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. Analog solutions will also prevail in the uh, in the age of AI. <laughs> in recent years, the rise of uh, big data has revolutionized many domains, including policing. Research is lacking, however, on the various ways in which the police use big data applications. Based on her research into big data policing by the LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department. Sarah Brenner concludes that in American police practice, and I cite, data are used for predictive rather than reactive or explanatory purposes. But our own uh, two-year empirical research into big data policing by the Dutch police, however, shows that applications in this area are deployed far more broadly and differ in function and complexity. What stands out is that the predicting crime is actually the least conventional use by police organizations. In fact, AI applications in police practice are mainly used for internal and administrative processes. And when it comes to intelligence and investigation of crime, they are not used predictively, but in real time and retrospectively. Let me explain this. In the case of real time support, AI applications are used to reduce the burden on police capacity and accelerate police work, but also to process information that could not be managed in a timely fashion if it were only processed by humans. An example of this is the automatic number plate recognition cameras, which can compare the number plates of passing cars with those recorded on the reference list of vehicles wanted by the police, for instance, because they have been used for run raiding. In the street, police officers have access on the smartphones to various linked police apps that tell them where a suspect is, whether they are armed and dangerous, how groups of rioters are moving throughout the city, and what's happening on social media. Retrospective applications include AI applications in criminal investigations, particularly when large volumes of data need processing, such as reading millions of intercepted crypto communications from the chat service EncroChat that is used by criminal organizations. Algorithms trained on different language models and labeled indicators can filter the data by priority, which matches messages needs reading first, and rapidly find connections that are relevant for the investigation of an issue, such as Monday laundering or drug trafficking. In this way, the data storage devices that are sized are effectively rewound and AI applications function like a time machine that lead the police to the past rather to the future. Our two-year empirical research into the Dutch police also reveals that to date, the use of big data by police organizations mainly involves simple applications, such as investigation apps with mainly relative simple algorithms for street work or linking and unlocking large databases. In other words, what we see here are very weak forms of AI. There is no question of complex advanced data processing models or self-learning applications that adapt their rules on the basis of learning experiences or act completely autonomously, that is without human intervention. One possible explanation for the divergence between our findings and previous ones is that the situation in the Netherlands is very different from the UK or the USA. In the Netherlands, many AI applications are developed and maintained in-house by police employees. In the United States, much is outsourced to third parties, 
and these differences could lead to different results of big data policing in practice. It brings me to big data policing beyond the police. People my sister, sorry. <laughs> big data policing is also uh, carried out um, by parties operating below or beyond the police. Yeah. yeah, it's also uh, beyond the police, which play an increasingly important role in security and safety management. Many tech parties from Amazon to Tesla also work in security and safety management using large data sets and algorithms and following their own rules and guidelines. In the first part of this talk, I talked about the waste navigation app and the transition from disciplinary to psychopower. But other well-known examples of big data policing beyond the police are the smart doorbell ring from Amazon and the electric cars from Tesla. Buy a Tesla or the ring doorbell from Amazon and you get free surveillance along with it. If we switch on the sentry mode of the Tesla, the built-in cameras record the driver's behavior, including how much throttle the driver gives, how the driver takes corners, the driver's braking behavior and supercharging history. And the four cameras on the outside of the Tesla standardly record images if the car notices danger. Tesla uses this technology to capture individuals trying to damage the car or attempting a break-in. And when these people come into view of the cameras, the owner receives a warning on the Tesla app. As a result, both the driver actions and everything outside the car are constantly monitored and analyzed by the tech company that, collect, that collects all data inside and outside the Tesla and records it in a unique driver profile. On a side note, the Mozilla Foundation, an organization that works to map out the role of the internet in people's lives, has listed what personal data car manufacturers have access to. Research reveals the excessive data collection by these companies. Not only is far more data collected than is strictly necessary, from your medical and genetic information to your sex life, it also turns out that 84% of the car companies in the study share customs data with service providers, data brokers and investigation agencies. Of all the companies studied, Tesla fails of all the reviews that looked at security, data control and AI, making them by far the worst of all cars studied. The second example is a smart, bell, smart doorbell ring by the American tech company Amazon. The ring is more than just a doorbell. It also functions as a security camera that records images throughout the day, which the users can later view and share with others and the police. And this gives rise to a complete new surveillance circle to make neighborhoods safer, compounding issues around the relationships and boundaries between private and public interests. Meanwhile, the company Ring is working, just as Tesla, on a facial recognition system, system that gives a signal through what they call the watch list function when a suspicious person is recognized on the doorbell camera images. Here, the American company speaks of the new neighborhood watch. But what are the consequences of this in terms of security? Taking into account that the Ring Company has been working with more than 4,000 different American police forces, giving the police access to the images on the Ring platforms without any clear legal control. Is it desirable that both Amazon and the police can see everything that goes on around the house? Does the digital doorbell lead to a drop in the number of burglaries? This also raises a number of complicated legal issues, issues such as where private spaces ends and public spaces begins. In order to better understand these examples of big data policing beyond the police, I speak of federal security. And the work of authors like Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek minister, and Jody Dean, an American philosopher, is very helpful in comprehending the relationship between, on one hand, feudalism and surveillance. They describe society in terms of techno-feudalism, whereby a very small elite of tech companies have become so large and influential that they wield complete control over the markets, including safety and security management. 
in doing so, tech companies such as Amazon, originally a big shop, and Google, originally a search engine, offer technological solutions to social problems, increasing the potential of big data policing. Yet their role and power are not at the heart of criminological interest, nor have set alarm bells ringing in the field of criminology. Nevertheless, it's clear that these companies see a very lucrative future in data relating to crime and antisocial behavior. They not only buy up small companies that are active in this area, but also sell crucial services and digital tools to the police and local authorities to prevent or investigate crime. These companies, for instance, look at urban areas from the perspective of improving security in entire neighborhoods, from monitoring by streetlights to, street to prevent burglaries, to smart cameras that detect aggressive, aggressive behavior before it takes place. This means we will need to think about what role we should allow such companies to play in security policy. To what extent is the dependence on tech companies desirable? And how does the government retain oversight and authority over the data and algorithms used. This brings me to the fourth and final part of the lecture, how to study the object of AI and algorithms in criminology. What should criminology want from the study of algorithms? And what does it even mean to study AI and algorithms? And I propose today four different areas of research. The first area of research is what I call AI experiences. There's no society without technology and there is no technology without society. And this makes everything social technological, technological and all oppositions between humans and technology or between the social and the technological completely unfounded. A simple argument that is still not very well understood. It means that AI is also always a social practice that the experiences of individuals who come into contact with AI from security professionals and consumers of luxury surveillance must be involved in academic research on the subject. This means that more intensive and long-term criminological studies I think are needed to establish what's really going on with the effects of AI and algorithms and the social interactions between the general public and parties specialized in this area. This fits into the title of today, Making the Surveillance Public, because phenomena such as big data policing exist by the grace of social sorting. And one of the risks of which is that real people are reduced to abstract profiles, fading into the background and disappearing from the picture. Focusing on AI experiences deals then with a social need to give a voice to everyone who is currently going unheard or has heard too little on the subject of digital surveillance, such as the silenced voices of weak, vulnerable or marginalized groups and the meanings they attach to surveillance of and in their lives. And I'm also thinking of experiential knowledge of practicing professionals, such as police officers, and private security personnel, and the meanings those people attach to digital forms of surveillance. Second area of research I call investments and interest. I spoke about luxury surveillance, I spoke about algorithmic cycle power, and I spoke about feudal security. Three theoretical concepts that I've introduced today. Now, however different these concepts may be, they all imply that AI is always the embodiment or effect of certain forms of power and knowledge. These concepts enable us to pose questions as to the use of AI applications and its knockout on and its knock-on effects in citizens' lives. What form of power are we now talking about? How does that power work? Who profits from it? And I've shown that tech parties are increasingly becoming a significant power factor in security and are fulfilling an extension need for security for various population groups. The state power of these techno-political parties is increasingly rapidly, is increasing rapidly, and their algorithmic uh, manner of operating is described both as parasitic and predatory. The role of tech parties in security invokes research how these parties are increasingly frequently and extensively involved in facilitating security provision, carrying out police-like tasks 
and working with large data sets and algorithms while being subject to far fewer regulations than the state or, poly or pu public sector parties. Market power on the one hand and data power on the other hand can be a dangerous cocktail, especially if there's a substantial lack of legal clarity in issues such as the ownership of data. Who owns the data people leave behind on Amazon and Tesla's digital platforms, for instance? Who is permitted, permitted to see this personal data and use it for other purposes? This brings me to the third part of research, what I call AI imaginaries. AI and algorithms have what uh, Bergson and Deleuze called a fabulative function. They project into the world social imaginaries so intense that they take on a life of their own. And of all the motives for using AI in the field of public safety, a staring role goes to presumed technical and economical advantages. It seems that nowadays the AI debate is confined to efficiency and efficiency, often stemming from the idea that technology in itself is neutral. This, techno this technical and economical approach focuses on issues such as the speed which, uh, with which very large volumes of data can be collected, or arguments where both work processes and crime detection are comprehensively improved by the use of AI and algorithms. These two, we must not forget, are public values, and it's understandable that efficiency and efficiency are seen as important criteria for evaluation. However, the technical and an economic approach to AI does not sufficiently do justice to the complexity of social cultural problems such as criminality. You might say there is a need for a social technological reimagining of AI. In other words, could things be different? To quote David Lyon, what might happen if surveillance were guided by an ontology of peace rather than of violence, an ethics of care rather than of control, an orientation to forgiveness rather to suspicion. It's a question with countless answers which all have in common that we can only break free from a technical and economic perspective on AI by doing things differently. How can, for instance, AI applications generate ideas of goodness and what society ought to be? Surely it must be possible to design AI applications that reinforce security in a positive way. Surely it must be possible to use AI applications that focus on improving issues such as care and trust. In order to attempt to find a way forward with this, we need to create a social technological imaginary of AI, new ways of thinking, tackling seemingly inattractable problems. And this potential of the imagination, of the imagination, of the broadening of what intelligent systems can do and their significance in security brings me to the final area of research, public values. Many scientists nowadays working on AI and algorithms feel more comfortable engaging with the technical side of the story than talking about the direct relationship of AI with power structures and people's lived experiences. The discussion about AI is therefore largely restricted to the expertise and contribution of technicians. technicians with little of no involvement from other disciplines, in particular social sciences. Criminology has barely managed to make a mark on the political debate and on policy with respect to the use of AI in tackling crime. And that's remarkable because there are many, many legal and ethical sites to new surveillance technology and social concerns as to privacy, the risk of bias and abuse of power are entirely, uh, are entirely legitimate. One of the ambitions of criminology is to produce knowledge through research, which is then shared with policymakers, the public and other parties. But I think that criminological expertise can also be deployed in other ways. Nowadays, progress in AI is moving so rapidly that it requires anticipation of its potential positive and negative effects on society. And one way of dealing with this is to revise the position of criminology. This means, for instance, that academics should become involved earlier in the design of new AI applications, a position that comes close to what Loder and Sparks have termed an observer turn player. It's in the research and design phase of AI applications that we can join data professionals and policymakers 
in thinking proactively and critically about the aims and values at play and how best to deal with them. What aim do people and the police wish to achieve with AI? What values should be incorporated in its design? Now, of course, this position brings with it plenty of risks, balancing as it does between detachment and an involvement. The danger of ethics washing, where the scientist becomes part of the system and contributes to whitewashing digital surveillance, always lurks in the background. I nevertheless believe that for criminology to fully embody its social responsibility, it must not wait until everything has been implemented before examining how it all works. To put it bluntly, that is too little, too late, because by then the key choices have already been made. Ergo, an extremely complex task for academics, but a role which in my view fits perfectly into what I've termed today, making surveillance public. Thanks for your attention. If you're interested, uh, the book is out since <laughs> midweek. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, we have plenty of time for questions and discussion.